Maestro, how are you? Somebody hasn't they haven't called you. It's meant for someone who wears a tie. No, I'm not going to wear a tie. Which is never going to happen again. That's probably better. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, today, we're lucky to have one amongst us, uh, a, a world leader in this subject about which you're to hear. Uh, everyone knows uh, Dr. George Palmer for his expertise in surgical abilities and care. And affectionately, most people know him as GP3. Uh, I know him from several other words and, and uh, nomenclature. Uh, today, uh, he is going to show us uh, that the lead extraction is not just lead extraction. It's uh, a little bit more harrowing and challenging than most of us think. And uh, we asked him to give this presentation because of uh, the knowledge that we're all going to gain from this and approach these patients in the manner in which he has done over the last 20 years. So Dr. Palmer, please take the podium and deliver your talk where we're anxiously waiting. Great. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming, and thanks for having me here. I wanted to talk about, we've talked about lead extraction in the past, and some of you have a long tenure in this facility, um, may have heard some bits and pieces of this, but I wanted to talk about three new developments that I think are important in lead extraction. Uh, we'll go through the usual discussion about indications and so forth, but I want to go ahead and tee off. These are my disclosures, so I teach for Spectrenetics, now Philips. Um, I'm a consultant at Core Matrix, and I do some research for a new firm called Safina on saponous vein harvesting. This is where we work. We're proud of it. But when I came here, this, had, this building had just gone up, and people were discovering things about it like not enough elevators, et cetera, et cetera. This is my group. Because of my group, I've been allowed to pursue this, pursue this hobby. I call it a hobby because it really is It's a micro, micro niche of cardiac surgery. And it's, it's, it's fun, it's, a lot, it's challenging, it's, an, it's the interface of cardiology, particularly EP, and cardiac surgery, much not unlike uh, what Tabor is doing with interventional and cardiac surgery. This is my current group. I had a casual conversation between myself and my partner. After about 10 cases in 2006, I said, geez, you know, this is kind of cool, it's fun, but it's dangerous. And I got this response. So with Yogi Berra in mind, we, if they do OK, they'll be all right. You know, I, with that, that didn't sit well necessarily with me. But nevertheless, this is where we went. It caused me to be reflective. And this fella is Peter Starrick. He was my na major professor at University of North Carolina when I was a fellow there. And during that time, it was the, the heyday of the startup of AICDs. And in those days, Companies like CPI, companies like Ventratech, were inventing all sorts of devices that could be implanted all, all surgically. And in that time, we implanted a lot of stuff. We put patches around the heart. We put patches uh, on the pericardium. We did all this stuff. But actually, it was found about five years later, none of that stuff worked. Well, I could have told you that as a resident, because it was miserable. And uh, those patches would crinkle. They wouldn't defibrillate. They would get infected. And it was a disaster. And I resolved at that time 
that I would never touch a lead again. Fast forward a little bit. Um, things have changed. This is a picture from UNC at, well, it's actually not UNC, and I'll tell you why. This cannot be from UNC. This is a picture of how we used to extract it in the old days, which we would tie a lead to a beer bottle, or at UNC it would be a Coke bottle. But So this must have been at Duke, because nobody at UNC would leave a, a beer bottle unattended like that um, <laughs> to, to, a, to a patient. But never, the idea was you leave it, and it would gradually pull this thing out, and sometimes you'd have a, a little bit of excitement the next day. Well, let's fast forward. This is 2018 HRS conference. And the thing that, that you have to understand is that the father of lead extraction is this fellow right here. This fellow who was at University of Miami uh, for many years with a very extensive practice, and some of the perfusion is here, practiced with Charlie Bird. And uh, Charlie was a cardiac surgeon of some repute uh, back in the 80s, but he got into the lead extraction business with very simple tools, and he's surrounded here by some thought leaders. Now, this fellow, I don't recall. I'm, I'm sure he's an EP, but I don't know where from. Roger Carrillo is known to all of us in the surgical arena. And then this is Andy Kaiser, who at the time was chairman at UNC and has moved on to East Carolina University. Interestingly, that it's HRS. It's not the Society of Thoracic Surgeons. That's a different comment. Let's talk about the topic. So the concern, there's a lot of leads. There's, there's lots of them going in. And to say that there's a diversity of and planning operators is the largest understatement ever made. In some states, family practice people put in devices. I don't think they put in defibrillators, but they certainly put in pacers. And so you'll see all kinds of different things happen. The estimated problem rate's about 4 to 5% annually of implanted, upgraded, and chronic endovascular leads. We're not talking about epicardial leads here. We're talking about endovascular leads. Infection ranks at about 2 to 7% for replacement and upgrades. So we're not talking about primaries. So the primary implant rate, 0.5% is extremely high. That's reported, but it's really high. Be, at this place, it would set off alarm bells. But uh, 2 to 7% is about right for anything you do in a pocket beyond primary implant. Malfunction, venous occlusion. Venous occlusion is now becoming uh, a big deal because people have lots of hardware and lots more stuff. Certainly upgrades, which is the mantra of many, many wives. Um, uh, increasing hardware burden, increasing risk of occlusion, risk of infection, and hardware failure. This is an interesting slide that I came across. And what it shows is if you start at ground zero as an implanter, a brand new implanter, excuse me, extractor, in 1997, you started and everything you did was infection. And that reflects a lot of things. It reflects, first of all, usually the backlog in the community, like we had here when I first started back in, 90, excuse me, back in 2005. There was a large backlog in the community, and it went and went and went. And as people understand that your results are OK or acceptable, then other referrals start coming. And this goes. But infection really never goes away. It's certainly 55 to 60 percent of your practice at any one time. Well, infection can look like a lot of things. You know, this looks like a little pwn here. You know, this is the VA clinic, Tomer, you know. And, um, and, or it can look like this. And this is what we see a lot of. We see a little bit of doughiness in a, in a pocket, partially treated or red and painful. If it's painful, it's almost always infected. Uh, and so if the patient tells you they got a painful this, that, and the other, it's worth exploring. This is a, another slide. This shows kind of a peekaboo. You can see this is really impending erosion, but it's not. It's actual erosion. It's got a little hole there. You can see the, uh, the uh, veins, which are distended here, indicating a subclavian vein is indeed occluded on that side, and the usual peekaboo deal. There's another way that you can determine these. There's another way, and it's now uh, it's been tried. Uh, the use of the EMR, electronic medical record, for enhancing detection of infected devices. So what it does is it uses a sepsis alert with device presence, okay? Uh, and usually bacteremia with leads presence. And if you restrict this to gram-positive organisms, you'll actually get some interesting data. So South Coast is up on the south coast of Massachusetts. It's not anywhere else we know about. They tried this. They, these are all EPIC systems, by the way. Um, the 103, uh, in, excuse me, EPIC information systems, 103 alerts. They got 12 cases, 12 extractions out of that. Similar at Yale. Uh, Yale was first to really bring it to light and report it to a group of extractors uh, two years ago. 
Um, and, excuse me, one, yeah, two years ago we started hearing about this, and then this is their data as of about a year ago. North Shore in, Lo in Long Island, same kind of thing. But Sarasota just went online, and they restricted it absolutely to gram positives, and so their yield in cases is actually higher. Now, I've been beating the drum here at Advent Health for about eight months, uh, and I'm hopeful that after this talk we'll get a little more traction. So how do you treat this? Well, there's really no complete treatment for device infection short of endo uh, with endocar or endocarditis of the lead without removal of all the hardware. Generator, pockets, et cetera, you have to control the pocket infection, and all the leads have to go. Mandatory means, in, oh, so that means infection, endocarditis of the valves, lead endocarditis, sepsis, pocket infection, valve endocarditis with a system. So in other words, if you have a valve that's infected, you have a present system, it is indicated to remove, to remove, the, uh, remove your hardware. Now, this can be done a variety of ways. When Tommy Martin was with us, Tommy would just chop the leads out at the time of doing you know, these gargantuan heart surgeries. And that's one way of doing it. Other ways would include things like doing it as a stage procedure. So occult gram positive in the presence of hardware and occult gram negatives in the presence of hardware will, um, will mean that. What are your clinical goals? Well, you want to eliminate the infection. You want to create whatever venous channels you might need for later. And then you want to eliminate the risk of any identified perforation. And you want to preserve a pacing mode. So what you don't want to do is take a bunch of stuff out and not have a good avenue for, per, for, uh, for pacing these patients. Otherwise, you'll never see your, an EP ever again. It is a team sport. This is a team sport. Preoperatively, I highly encourage all of my new extractors to engage at their institution with ID. ID is the single most important person you can align with. You should be joined at the hip with. They will help you immensely. They will locate the organism. They will tell you what antibiotic. They will do the dosing on the antibiotic. They'll make sure you don't kill them with it. And then the next thing is they will tell you when it is safe to reimplant. Okay? So ID is critical. Renal medicine is a great treasure trove of a lot of very sick patients who have many, many device issues. Of course, ER medicine, general cardiology, family practice. Family practice is funny because if you start talking to the family practitioners, the first thing that you, that you hear from them is, oh, I've got six or seven guys that I've treated conservatively with, uh, you know, with um, uh, suppressive antibiotics, and they do just fine. Well, the truth is they don't do just fine. They suppress the antibiotics until they get lead or, and or tricuspid endocarditis, and then they have troubles later. EP services, obviously, uh, the EPs are your best friends in terms of support and also for referral. And then medical oncology, we get a few referrals, not as many as we did, for radiation uh, moving stuff around because it's going to be a radiated area, radiated area, particularly for breast patients. It's important to know the biology of the vein interaction. Simply put, just think about wherever a lead touches on the endocardium, it's going to cause an inflammatory reaction. That inflammatory reaction can be anything from just a little fibrinous reaction or no reaction, or it can get to calcification. If you traverse the periosteum going through uh, in a subclavian approach, that will become ossified with time. And that's a challenge. That is a challenge. Certain illnesses can make this a little bit worse, and we'll talk about it. This is an idealized, I used to call these netarisms, but it's somebody else now. So, but this is, what it shows you is the usual implant site. What's important to understand here is that the, how you implant these things is critical, okay? This is not just a casual walk in the park. How you put it in should be posterior and lateral, okay? So it's got a very nice, easy bend. There's no crinkling here. There's no uh, angulation at the insertion site, and I'll show you that in a minute. But this is a usual one. It comes in here. Generally, this lead touches the lateral side of the SVC, which is uh, mostly, much of the SVC is uh, adjacent to the pleural space, not so much endocardially, excuse me, endo, uh, endopericardial. This is just a picture of a very nice, this is a very nice pacemaker that I don't know, I wish I'd, I could claim, but I didn't do it. I'm sorry, the defibrillator. But I wish I could claim it, but I didn't do it. The thing that's so lovely about this is the very lateral and posterior and such a nice bend. I would expect those leads to last a very long time. It's the angulation that kills the lead long term in the, in the circulation and then gives you those, uh, the 20% failure rate at 10 years, for, particularly for ICDs. This is a, this is a picture. I, I'm not going to pick on the VA, but I think that's where it came from. This is not as perfect. So this is a medial approach. You see how this angles right here? That tells you immediately that 
that you're going to be dealing with some uh, bony adherences of this of this lead on the underside of that, and that will constitute a challenge at, at least at the beginning of the case. And again, this is so this is a by the ICD. You can see that the dual coil ICD. This is the little that's the telltale of a uh, of a coronary sinus lead, and then you can see the little flip up of the right atrial lead. Scar formation is usually time dependent. You know, the general comment is that if it's been in a year, it probably has enough scar tissue to, to warrant some sort of extractive uh, technology, which means extra energy. And then some conditions that uh, renal failure is a bad actor, radiation is a very bad actor on a vein, uh, and then hyperparathyroidism for hypercalcification. So there are some specific leads that you need to be aware of that cause unique scar patterns. There is a backfilled versus a non-backfilled riata, and what does that mean? Backfill just means that the crenellations of the coil are filled so that the scar tissue cannot grow actually into, into the lead. So the backfilled leads are a little more benign than the non-backfilled leads. There's also a starfish coronary sinus lead, which is a challenge to get out. It get, looks like a little cancer when you finally try and get it out. It's got all of this, um, this sort of uh, crab-like excrescences in the coronary sinus. And then fine wire is its own challenge. It's a little slinky, and you have to... There's a few items about that you need to know. The most important thing in extraction is not the technology. It is selecting the technology. It is really, it is the judgment and experience of the operator, much like PCI or anything else. These are the usual attributes. This is, a, I made a list of this. Somebody asked me to make a list of these things. You know, what does it take to do this? And I just said, this is, the most important thing is really right here, okay? You gotta know when to fold them. You gotta know when to stop, okay? So a lot of people, I think surgeons are a little more inclined to do this than the electrophysiologist. Surgeons kind of say, oh, this is going to be fine. You know, I'll just keep going and I'll keep going and the next thing you have a little bit of a disaster and we'll talk about those. But it's important to know that this isn't cancer, this is lead extraction. So if you have a problem and you feel it's not going well, stop, don't amputate the leads, put it back in the pocket and make a phone call. And there's lots of guys that can be around, I mean, I'm around. There's Roger Carrillo down in South Florida. There's Pete Graper down in Sarasota. There's lots of people around. And then there's, of course, the Cleveland Clinic, which I don't think I'd, uh, anyway, it's a long way. This is just, uh, this is complication rates you, uh, relative to operator experience. As you go past 300, your complication rates come down. Now, this is, this is not an accurate slide. I can tell you that the death rate, there is a death rate for these people and not fully reported is actually a lot more than that. So a lot of people don't report their results. But this was uh, what Chuck Love reported in 2008. Let's define what we're doing. Lead removal is just pulling it out, okay? So within a year, you frequently can pull these out, and I get calls all the time, can I just pull this lead out? And if it's under a year, I'd say, yeah, give it a try, but if it won't come, just seal it up and send it up, we'll deal with it. Um, and then lead explantation is removing or pacing, as you can just read there. There's no locking stylet, telescoping sheaths, or extraction tools. Extraction, however, is usually over a year, requires special equipment not included in the implant package. So when you start getting into locking stylets and so forth, then that is considered extraction. It's usually done, 90, whoops, I'm sorry, 95% of these are done through the implant site. So if we have a left-sided, typically in these, are, in these parts, left-sided is the usual, and so, um, you know, 95% of them are done via that, but there's lots of alternative approaches we've done, and we have done these. Right thoracotomy with and without venotomy, right atriotomy for control. Uh, we've done a laser through the right atriotomy before. Uh, standard open techniques, a sternotomy and chop like Tommy does. And then uh, creative approaches for congenital acquired. Femoral workstation is becoming more and more popular, and it's very interesting the, uh, the vectors on how you can pull these leads down as opposed to trying to pull them out. Okay, and there's also a right neck approach, which is very useful. Charlie Kennergan out of uh, out of Göttingen, Sweden, he said uh, he he presented a series of those which were really slick. So why do we extract and not just pull? Because there's endovascular scar. Uh, it's at defined points. It's, it may be visible on some imaging study. Um, uh, Roger had a phenomenal set of digital subtraction venography on CT scan, which was uh, which was beautiful, but it didn't really risk assess enough. Um, remember that calcium is never your friend. If you see calcium, particularly in the veins, if you see it on a chest x-ray, beware. Think about that. The multiple tools are available. The locking stylet is clearly the most important. 
It is a, these are simple mechanical tools that expands the footprint within the lead. Think about the lead has a little, hot, uh, for those of you who don't know, the lead has a hollow tube that goes all the way to the end. And that gives you an opportunity to actually bind that in, into a unit so you can control the tip. So once that happens, once you do that with the locking stylet from whatever company you want, you can do it, Cooks, Spectrumetics, whoever, um, once you have that locking stylet in place, you're really, you're good. Those, that lead's gonna come out one way or another. Um, about 20% of them, if you just kind of work with them a little bit, they'll come out without any other extractive energy. But um, most people will then apply either a powered mechanical tool, either from Cook or Spectronetics here in the US. Laser energy is what I use uh, very frequently. But clearly the most important tool is the locking stylet. That is the key to life. And then we could go through the lead prep, but that's a very detailed um, uh, discussion that I, I'll defer to Dr. Mavertis' book that we spent a lot of time uh, drawing and taking pictures of. Basic physics, as you pull and you break up the little, uh, the little adhesions, what happens to the force on the tip? Well, it goes way up. The force on the tip as you pull goes way up as you lice adhesions going into the heart. Additional energy and tool selection depends on the comfort of the operator, where he was, how he was raised, who trained him, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But you gotta think about this terms, in terms of dwell time and what the lead is you're trying to take out. Techniques, these are, this is all simple stuff. Simple traction, traction devices, mechanical sheaths, laser sheath, electrosurgical, which means basically cautery, and then a rotating threaded tip. In the first generations of mechanical tools, these the rotating threaded tips became very popular because they had nice feedback back to the operator. But boy, they twisted and turned and broke everything uh, and left a lot of parts behind. That has changed. Now they're bi-directional rotating sheaths, which are really a, a master, mastery and improvement. The other thing is that these telescoping sheaths are really cheap. And so if you go, if we go down, if we do it, imagine Florida Hospital or Advent sends us to Bogota or sends us to the middle of the jungle to do extraction, what we're gonna get is these telescoping sheets because they cost like about 100 bucks, you know? Finally, the technique that I, I think is probably the most uh, pu uh, puckering uh, is the reach and grab taught by uh, Charlie. So when I was with Charlie down there, he said, listen, all you gotta do is take this little pituitary ronger and put it through the atrium and grab that thing and yank on it. And I'm going like, really? And it was, it, he, he did it and it worked, but um, I'm, it's not something I'm really that jazzed about. This is just a picture. The, the purpose of this picture is to kind of show you the, what the scar is. The scar happens wherever this lead, this is the lead here, going through scar. And then this is, the, in this case, the laser with a rigid outer sheath. People say, what do you need a rigid outer sheath for? You need it for mechanical advantage. Because when you get to places where the laser can't perform, the outer sheath may help you in terms of localized force. Remember the basic physics stuff, okay? Why do we use a laser? We get complete locking, complete extraction with locking stylet. We control the distal tip, and it gives you basically a little cigarette wrapper around the lead. The idea is to take that cigarette wrapper all the way to almost to the tip and then be patient and let it deliver. The early mechanical systems I already said, but the current stuff, the birotational cook and tight reel systems do pretty well. Uh, they're not my favorite. This is just a little, this, this is a, uh, a little um, animation to show you what it looks like. So again, this is, there's the locking stylet going down. And as you see here, it now is expanding kind of like that little Chinese thing you had when you were a kid pulling, putting your finger in there, and it locks in place. Now, this is a very idealized picture showing the laser cutting through magnificently and circumferentially through this scar. What it does not show is that, you're, that the number one teaching point in these is that you must distend, you must pull on this structure. You distend the mediastinum to your side so you accentuate this angle here. You want that angle accentuated so you can lyse those adhesions and so you're hopefully not getting outside of the vena cava at this point. Okay. That was so successful, I'm just delighted. Okay. So how, does it, how do the patients present? Well, they present in a lot of different ways. I got bad leads, how old, where are they? Are they pacer dependent? Are they anticoagulated? And do, are they on Plavix? Plavix is kind of a nasty issue. Um, 
patients with stents and, and have all this do need to be sort of carried across, not just say stop it for three or four days. I think, I think it was Arius that, that saw a patient with an acute thrombosis from a general surgery case uh, that somebody just stopped the Plavix and gee whiz, what happened? It didn't go well, all right? Examination, we look at the chest wall like we talked about. Have they had previous surgery? What is the appearance of it? And then what are, how many collaterals, or not how many, but are there good collaterals around? The lab exams, the most important thing is a chest x-ray. That's why I put it three times, you know, it's kind of simple. Um, the CT scan is not important for except do I have a patent SVC on the, a subclavian vein on that side? That can be important. And then in patients like renal failure patients who've had all kinds of dialysis catheters and stuff, you want to know what's available on the other side. So actually, uh, the uh, CT scan can be very helpful in regards to that. Venography can usually be done in the operating room. Pre-op consideration for everybody. So you have to do this on a checklist. Pacer dependence, what's their coag status? Preoperative antibiotics, are they correct? Are they correct is important. And then in the early days, we typed and crossed everybody for a couple of units of cells. Uh, with experience, we came down to sort of a type and hold kind of thing. Uh, we use general anesthesia on every case. We live and die on TEE in all of cardiac surgery. And so it's no different here. There are other people that will use ICE, the uh, intracoronary, or not intracoronary, but intravascular ultrasound. Uh, but that just gives me too much to do. So I, I like somebody else to do the TEE and at least have it available to me. I am jealous of all of those who have interventional suites that have multiple panels in front of you. So you can display hemodynamics on one panel, x-rays on the next panel, or live x-rays on the next panel, and then your TEE on the third panel because it allows you to collate so much information so quickly. So you need to give informed consent. This is a very big issue in lead extraction. Um, you know, the early operators that, that start, the people that we teach and so forth, it's important that they know kind of what the national benchmarks are and all that kind of stuff. But it's more important that you know your own data because most patients want to know, okay, how many have you done? How many of you, how many of you hurt? And how have you hurt them? Your team experience, so you're going to have to really generate a team. I can tell you that having taught a lot of people how to do this, you can tell in kind of the first 30 seconds to two minutes whether or not they're ever going to be successful at it. And the reason is because um, when you train a surgeon, they have to organize teams every single day of their life, right? So they're, they're constantly doing that. That's a little foreign to some of the other specialists. So the interventional radiologist, I'm not so sure. The EPs or um, the electrophysiologist may or may not do that. Some, particularly some of the EPs that I've trained from the outlying areas, have really never taken to it. Maybe I was just a terrible teacher, I guess. But, but I think their biggest problem was organizing a team around them. Use lots of specialists. So it's a, it, basically, this is what it looks like in the operating room. You've got all these people, all right? If your operator is not a surgeon, then immediate surgical standby has to be arranged. This has been a subject of multiple lawsuits, not just in Florida, but all over the country. Uh, when, the sur when they said, oh yeah, you got surgical standby, and the surgeon is either at his office or doing another case or whatever. And when the, the problem is that if real disaster strikes you, then you need immediate coverage. Um, so this is the setup, general anesthesia, TE, wide prep and drape. We use a nine French introducing in the femoral vein, although we've changed that. And this next statement is very important. You know, you could put a nine French introducer into somebody in the operating room, but until you tell anesthesia that this is their line, they never know it's there. So you have to activate it with them. You have to run the fluid up, look them in the eye and say, this is your line, and then they own it. And, they, and that is the proper resuscitative line if there's a brachiocephalic injury, which is the most feared, okay? Arterial lines are not optional. Always consider the bridge balloon. What's a bridge balloon? Well, as a great skeptic of the bridge balloon who's named it many, many things from blow up dolls to God knows what, the, here is what the bridge balloon really is. The bridge balloon is a device. It is a Kevlar balloon inserted over femoral wire and insufflated with contrast to position at the SVC. Once it's there, then you can pull it back a little bit and you can proceed with your lead extraction. But the purpose is for tamponade in the event of an SVC injury. Okay? It's originally described in a white paper by 2005 by guess who? Me. And I was laughed right out of the consortium saying, that, that's silly, I'd never do that. You know, it would slow you down, this, that, and the other. But the company thought a little differently, and they worked it out in the pig model when it was Spectronetics, not Philips. And in the lab, it had these effects. 
It dramatically reduced the amount of bleeding. It extended the period of time for which repair could be affected. Remember, as general surgeons, when we were a general surgeon or an ER nurse, it was called the golden hour of trauma. Okay? So you had a little bit of time, and during that time, you, the patient was kind of quasi-stable, and you could do things to affect them. Get them to the operating room, get studies, whatever it might be. This is the same. So what it's really extending that period of time. And in, and in theory, it allows for a simpler repair. In other words, a direct suture repair, whatever. The company was all about, oh, we can do this off pump. And I just cringed when I hear that, because heparin is always your friend in these circumstances. But it, it also gives you a much larger IV uh, infradiaphragmatic place. It was approved for humans. And what I want to show you now, and this is the injury we're talking about. This is basically a schematic of what it is. You can see that there wasn't a rail. They were not pulling on this hard. And then their, your laser or whatever extracted tool came out, perforated that. And that bleeding is not quiet bleeding. That is not a little bit of bleeding. That is massive bleeding that requires, and with hemodynamic, severe hemodynamic compromise, which requires immediate intervention. Forgive me for using company slides, but I'm, I think this is important enough that you all need to see this. So this is, the, this is the actual balloon, what it looks like. So it's a little tough guy. It's a tough one. You fill it up. You fill it with, with contrast so you know where it is. This is what has happened. So it deploys in about two minutes. Once you've got it in, there are some workflow issues in the operating room that you have to deal with and learn. Okay? But it does stop a lot of the blood loss. It gives you about 30 minutes, they say, 30 minutes of, of hemostasis but the results are what, the, what is most important, and I'll show you that in a second. So they wanted to know, SVC tears during lean extract, very rare, less than 0.5 is actually less than that, but it's in a worldwide study of 30,000 extractions, um, they found, we well, are about to see that, there's still a 50% mortality even after interventions in most centers, okay? So here's the study, 30,000, 30,000 extractions worldwide, 91 confirmed, uh, cable events, 36 balloons were used, 55 non-balloon. The results with the non-balloon are fairly typical. So these patients may be alive, but they may not be right, okay? So you can imagine with large hemodynamic compromise in which then you have to split the sternum, do things and so forth, that the neurologic injury rate can be high, and indeed it is. Because the old information was if you haven't started resuscitating these people and operating on them, within five minutes, then you lose them. And you don't lose them from intraoperative misadventures. You lose them because they're neurologically impaired. And they're usually the families withdraw or they're, or they're neurologically dead. Okay? So 56, 56 went out, 44 didn't make it. But in the balloon usage, 91% were discharged alive. Now, I didn't. I don't know if they're all neurologically perfect. I would assume so. Um, but the 8.3 did die. Okay, so, but this is an enormously important slide, enormously important take-home message um, for the use of, uh, of the balloon. This is just the raw data that, that they show you. There was actually a balloon, balloon cohort used properly and then a balloon improper usage. So people would push it up, pull it down, throw it away, and then say, oh, yeah, I used the balloon. Well, that's not exactly. That won't hold up. That won't pass it. So the important take-homes with this, the guide wire needs to be in the vein. So you pass the guide wire up. All the interventionalists are laughing. They say this is doodah stuff. But for the, for the people that are kind of naive to this, the femoral introducer prior to lead extraction, the bridge is not a substitute for surgical repair. I can tell you that I sit on several panels that where this is discussed ad nauseum. Okay? And the first blush on this uh, elicited the first response, which nearly put me into orbit, which was one of the EPs from, I don't know what institution, maybe up north someplace, oh, we don't need surgeons anymore. So you just, you know, you kind of you roll your eyes and so forth and so on. But this is very important. This is not a substitute. This is an adjunct, okay? So this is helping you. It also, also it's really important that you have all of your other safety protocols in place. So. That's that. All right, this is, this is my favorite slide of all times. Everybody's seen this a million times. This is the Blue Angels. The Blue Angels are like the, the excuse me for those. I had dinner with, with Hoff last night from, uh, from ORMC. And his son is uh, in the, fun, both, both of his sons are Air Force Academy graduates. So he saw that slide and he just cringed. But 
Anyway, the point of this is that these are guys that prepare endlessly. They plan very carefully. They execute flawlessly. And when they debrief, it is merciless. Okay? So, and, and that's kind of what we kind of have to do, in, I think, in lead extraction. So operative management, you've got to ask yourself a couple of questions. Do I have to retain central access? You control the sleeves. You get the stylets. You unscrew. Locking stylet is absolutely everything. Riata is a whole different deal. Riata is a failed lead from St. Jude in which there is delamination of the, of the conductor coils. Those have to be controlled and decompressed, and there's ways to do that. Uh, we've written about it, and we've actually presented it in, a, in text form. And, uh, and then there's other, the Riata is very important, a lot of mortality associated early on with, more, with, Riata, um, with Riata extraction. Fine wire takes its own, it's got its own issues. It's just a little slinky and you've got to deal with it. This is just how you do it. I don't think this is so important. I think the important points have kind of already been made. But the big deal is that you're not hammering this thing. A laser is a fine cutting tool. You use it, you pull back, you use it a little bit, you pull back, you use a little bit. You've got to realign, you have to do, take, you have to be very patient. I see a lot of people get very impatient with these things and really ram it, which is not the way to go. Uh, but you have to select your, your technology. If you're going under the clavicle, there's several nice mechanical tools that will help you get there. The laser may not get you there, so use something else. Some, if you come up against heavy calcification, you want to use a mechanical tool. So you take your laser out, you put a different thing in, and you just engage. These are the three problematic areas. We talked about the SVC, which is probably the most lethal. An injury down here in the ventricle, when you pull this out and say it goes transmural and you've got a hole, it's a problem, but it's not a lethal problem. It is a problem. As long as your surgeon is close by and you can get the chest open, this is not a lot different than a knife injury to the ventricle. So it is solvable. Uh, this is a lot harder to solve because of the degree, the amount of injury and the place where it is, which reminds me of one other thing. So I was talking, I was given this talk um, in Medellin cartel, the Medi not to the cartel, but the Medellin, uh, in Medellin to a bunch of cardiologists in a, in a place like this. And in, and in Medellin, they have their own surgeons. And so I was talking about this is a tough place to get to and so forth and so on. And so at the end of the talk, all the cardiologists were very, you know, extraordinarily polite and very, very helpful. Uh, the surgeon came up to me at the end. He's about 45 years old, and he says, uh, he says, tell me, he says, this, this injury you're talking about, is this like a shotgun blast to the upper extremity? I said, yeah, it kind of is. He goes, hey, no problem. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it's a war zone there, and the, the, ex, the surgeons there are extraordinarily experienced. And so um, some things don't, some people, and some things don't. So the outer visi sheath we talked about, um, it's important. As you go to the anominate, you want to be what I call a sterile cockpit. So in, in commercial aviation, they have this thing which is sterile cockpit, which means there's no talking except about what you're doing. There's no, you know, talking about, uh, you know, your girlfriend or your shoe size or whatever it might be. Once you pass the, once you pass that, you go into the atrium. Don't end up set the lead into the atrium. Uh, so in other words, if you're pulling on this thing and it pulls into your laser, don't fire because now you have a beautiful hole in whatever cardiac structure. I've kind of lived through that before. So. This is what this is what uh, this is a lead for the Blue Angels. He's at about 75 feet over the ground, going 350 knots. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, he's not thinking about the football game. All right, he's not thinking about his girlfriend or his, you know, his kid's birthday. He's focused on the task at hand, which is what I like anesthesia to do when we're doing this, and what I like myself to do. You can leave that. You can leave things for central access. If there is infection, complete capsulectomy, water pick debridement, drainage, and closure of the dead space. And 85% of the time, this is going to work, which is a shocking statistic. Uh, it's absolute surgical heresy to say that you can take an infected space, close it, and expect it to do well. But it works. I think the key is removing the dead space. So and much like a breast, like when they do breast flaps, you've got this huge flap area, and you, you'll have a dead space. So you put a, a drain in there, leave it for two weeks, let it collapse, and it seems to work pretty well. You could prevent a lot of these complications through training, mentorship, and currency. What I call planning is basically that's patient specific. You know, when they come to your office, they tell you what to do. Systematics is all about team formation and development. We spend a lot of time talking about do we huddle, do we not huddle, um, uh, you know, 
Anesthesia has been very helpful here and very instrumental in developing protocols for their safety, for, for them augmenting our safety. Here's some pearls and pitfalls. Always provide backup pacing ability. Temporary screw, use of the coronary sinus lead, that's obvious. Always have your R2 pads. 360 is real important. Uh, the arterial line, these are things you must have. The corroboration of hemodynamics is important. I was invited by the administration of the hospital up to Jacksonville to, to, to kind of oversee or look something over. And what, it, what was happening was that the surgeon had been trained that every time there's a hemodynamic compromise, you open the chest. So we opened like four or five of them, and there wasn't an injury. But what there was was he was seeing that there was an injury, and, or he thought there was an injury because of the hemodynamics went down. But you can evert these ventricles, and I guarantee you'll lose hemodynamics then. But if you let go most of the time, it'll, it'll fill on its own. It'll do well. Always be prepared for disaster. Always consider the, the bridge balloon. And gee whiz, know when to fold them. Just know when to stop. If, you're, if it's not going well, you can come back another day when maybe you're feeling different or you got a different team or whatever. Um, and all it takes is then an explanation to the family afterwards. But um, that's important. This is something. An LV epicardial lead performed in conjunction with the extraction means that the left chest tube, not the TEE, is the indicator of intrapericardial bleeding. What does that mean? If you, do, if you put an extra lead on the surface of the heart, that means you've done a pericardial window. So the TEE is looking at the cardiac structures, but that means any blood that's in the pericardium is going to be going into the left chest. So the, so the chest tube that you placed is important. Look out for little old ladies, you know, these little old ladies in Florida, you know, blue hair, white knuckles on the steering wheel, that's what you want to be careful of. If you see their, if you see their veins, think about that. Okay? Radiation is also not your friend and can be very uh, uh, problematic. Once a coronary sinus lead you've extracted, then in all likelihood you're not going to be able to replace that. You're going to have to think about LV epicardial pacing. The fractures and abandoned leads, and we get, I think we probably get five referrals a year for a bunch of fractured and abandoned leads. These are a painful. Uh, usually it's a femoral workstation, a neck workstation, or the other thing that we've done is we've done right-sided Chamberlain approach, which is a right anterior thoracotomy. Go down to the cava, put purse strings in, and then uh, grab it with uh, whatever we have to grab it with, like Charlie taught us to do. Since inception, this is where we are. Um, by the solo operating surgeon, we've done well over a thousand. We're well over a thousand, but I'm going to give show you kind of a slice of our data. We've had 100% procedural success. We've had one death. One patient was open for that atrial misadventure that I told you about. Four patients were treated for endocarditis of the tricuspid valve. One comment here. When you have leads traversing the tricuspid valve and you, and you have tricuspid endocarditis, the resistance of tricuspid valve endocarditis treatment is related to lead presence. So if you pull those leads out, don't automatically go to the operating room the next day. We'll give them about a week and see if you get some resolution of the endocarditis, okay? Because it, will, it will actually really does help. Two of our patients required thoracotomy, two femoral workstations. I'm happy with the results so far. Um, we pulled our data. Now, unfortunately, for a long period of time, we were on what was called a cytor registry, and we missed a lot of stuff, um, a lot of the pulls. But there's some interesting trends here. Look at this. Look at this decreasing trend of use of laser. Um, it's going down. It's going down. Why is that? I think it's because we're, we're being a little more aggressive with our mechanical technologies and also uh, a little more aggressive with, this, with the locking stylet than, than we were early on. This is just kind of a, you know, it's a three to one ratio, male to, uh, two to one, male to female. And that was kind of all the way through. These are some others. This is the average age. It's interesting that, that as we progress in our career, the age is coming down. And I think that's a, that's, that's a good thing. That's actually a reflection of the confidence of our cardiology staff in what we're doing here. I, that's the way I would interpret that. And this is kind of interesting. This is the indications for the extracted bunch. Infection, 43%. Failed leads, fractured lead, malfunctioning lead. Look at all those bad leads in there. I mean, it's just terrible. Abandon, I don't know why people abandon leads, but they do. And then there's erosion. Erosion is kind of, you have to say, erosion really lumps with infection. Chronic pain, recalled lead, uh, dislodgement, reposition. SVC syndrome, we've had 
a few more of these, and, and vascular has been very helpful with that. So what we, pull, we pull the lead out. Uh, we leave a wire. They dilate it and put a stent in the SVC, and then we put a new system in afterwards. In terms of this restricted, this is a popular topic, restricted tricuspid septal leaflet, people will say, oh, geez, if I take the lead out, it'll get better. We've actually done three of these. And three in one, yeah, it actually did get better. But the rest of them, no, it was fibrose down, and it didn't, it didn't help at all. The other thing you can do is powder it when you're, uh, you can powder that, that leaflet uh, doing a laser. In conclusion, I'll just say the modern lead management requires this. Utilizing standardized methods, I think we are safe, reasonably safe, and our results are consistent with other centers. This is where we're going. I think this is where we're going anyway. We're going to have enhanced access using EMR for advanced screening. The first blush of that sepsis alert thing is that's just the first blush. As we refine that, we'll get better. It'll translate an increased number of extractions. Safety protocols will be enhanced by adjunctive technologies, making this more popular and acceptable. Okay? The continued uh, training and commitment, and then we'll see new sites of excellence and all this stuff. But the research is kind of going on. There's, there's actually competing companies out there that have some really good ideas. One Israeli company has got a, some pretty cool ideas. Um, Oh, yeah, and that's one of my favorite things to do. Sometimes lead extraction is like this guy. He's going 300 knots at the tree, below the tree line. Um, and, well, he's not thinking about anything about how much fun he's having, but, but kind of lead extraction is kind of that way sometimes. Sometimes you're feeling going really fast until something kind of happens. Thanks a lot. Any questions? <laughs> yes, sir, Dr. Everett. 